we decided to buy the cheapest Ryzen motherboard on Amazon. And as of November 15th, that was the Gigabyte A320M S2H. This video is sponsored by World of Warships. Now, if you haven't already heard of this game, you are missing out. It's so cool to be able to support something like this. World of Warships has the perfect balance of action and strategy with a heavy dose of true-to-life graphics, ship design, and physics. Command a massive naval fleet with over 200 unique ships and play across 11 different nations. It doesn't hurt to try, and I've got a feeling you'll be hooked. Best of all, you don't need to pay anything to play. Join now via the link below and register with the code PLAYWARSHIPS2018 to receive 250 doubloons, 1 million credits, a premium ship, and more. This motherboard's a peculiar one. Falling into the micro ATX subset, the board is also physically slimmer than conventional ATX counterparts, meaning you might have some extra space between your 24 pin and the cable routing cutouts in your case. Aesthetically, it isn't the sharpest tool in the shed. I mean, this is a $50 board, but at least it doesn't look like uh, this. We've got a black PCB for starters, one full 16 lane Gen 3 PCIe slot, and two smaller single lane slots just below. The S2H does not support Crossfire or SLI, not that you could manage to make it work anyway with this slot config. The board also lacks integrated Wi-Fi, only has two DIMM slots, two fan hubs, and a bare bone audio interface with the ALC887 codec. Not all is bad, however. One pleasant surprise is that this board supports second-gen Ryzen processors out of the box, including Ryzen 22 and 2400G APUs. With either, you'll be able to make use of the HDMI port. Not sure which gen we're looking at here since it isn't listed, meaning it's probably 1.4. This is disappointing seeing as the Ryzen APUs openly support HDMI 2.0 configs for 4K 60fps playback, though with 1.4, it'll be locked to 4K 30. This was confirmed with my 4K panel. You'll need discrete graphics if you intend to use this board for an HTPC, which is a bit disappointing. Why would you buy a micro ATX in the first place? But if you aren't an HDMI user just yet, you'll still find DVI and D sub ports on the S2H. Additional rear I.O. includes two PS2 ports, four USB 3.1 ports, two USB 2 ports, and an RJ45 port packed with the Realtek Gigabit LAN driver. The remainder of the board's layout is uh, its fairly straightforward. The A320 chipset resides under this small heatsink, doesn't really do much. Four SATA 3 ports are staggered to the right, and the 24 pin sits in its usual spot along with an 8 pin EPS up near the top left. Another peculiar feature of this board is M.2 support. If you plan to use an Athlon processor with this board, you'll be locked to the SATA interface, but Ryzen processors can drive a PCIe based connection for use with significantly faster solid state drives. This is something I did not expect to find in a $50 board, but I'll take it. No heatsink is included, but you know, it's still cool that it's there. Now, if you're worried about power delivery, you really shouldn't. I mean, not that you could conventionally overclock with this chipset anyway. I actually found that the BIOS will make it seem as though you're overclocking, but you really can't. And like I said earlier, buyers of these boards should be those concerned with very tight budgets, so overclocking probably isn't at the top of your priority list. With that said, let's take a look at the VRM anyway. The A220M utilizes an ISL9572, which is actually the same chip Gigabyte uses in its B350 and X370 motherboards. It relies on a 4 plus 3 phase array. Nothing on this board is doubled, meaning that we've got two phases up top for SOC and four down to the left uh, of the socket for vCore. Four core CPUs shouldn't have a problem with this board, and because this is a locked chipset, we don't expect anything approaching 10 watts of heat from the VRM itself. 4C 10N MOSFETs on the high side, 4C 06s on the low side, and we do have two of those per phase. No VRM heatsink is included with this board, however, which again complements the locked aspect of the chipset. All in all, despite a subpar power delivery system we've got going on here, this is actually pretty good when seen in the context of other first-gen Ryzen boards from Gigabyte. You'll actually find that a lot of B350 boards use a very similar setup uh, from a power delivery standpoint, so I'm actually I'm kind of impressed here. And the 95712 is the same Intersil uh, PWM generator, regulator, I should say, that is used in those higher end boards too. So, I don't know kind of cool. Now in our testing, the SOC VRM managed a fair 60 degrees Celsius via probing. Keep in mind, actual temps were likely hotter, but we'll use the same testing methodology going forward. A top mounted CPU fan config certainly does play a role into our VRM's peak temperature, so expect this to change if we switch to something a little more aftermarket, like maybe a Hybrid 212 Evo or a Cryorig H7. Our 65 watt 1300X, while under an identical load, managed to pull almost its exact TDP, about 64 
4 watts as measured with our clamp meter over hotlines and our EPS. The CPU reached a comfortable 71 degrees and our stock cooler managed to stay under 40 decibels thanks in large part to the CPU's low TDP. Now with respect to the S2H's BIOS, it's pretty much what you've come to expect from most Gigabyte boards at this point. I'm not the biggest fan of this style UEFI, but it does get the job done. Fan curves can be configured here, boot drives can be selected here, and XMP profiles can be toggled here. That's pretty much all you need to know about this A320 BIOS, given the fact that the chipset's uh, you know, boasting a very limited set of functions. I mean, you can't do much other than maybe overclock RAM and, uh, I don't know, like I said, change fan configs and uh, select your boot drive. I don't know what else you'd want to do on an A320 BIOS, but that's about all I was interested in. Now, one thing I do want to show you in real time, I have seen a few instances on forums where people have claimed they've been able to overclock on A320 uh, chipsets, and I think what they're actually seeing here is the fact that they can, like I said in the video, manually toggle the multiplier, right, the CPU clock ratio, this is what Gigabyte calls it, so you can change this to whatever you want. Like I can change this to, I can change it to 55. Boom, we got a 5.5 gigahertz uh, overclock, right, on paper. But then we go to save this, and, and th this setting will hold, by the way. This will show up again if we if we reboot. It'll it'll act as though it's stuck. Uh, but we'll go to save and exit, and then I'll show you in CPU Z uh, what the system is actually reporting the CPU frequency um, is operating at. And it is nowhere near 55. Actually, it will cap at around 3.6, which I think is what the CPU uh, out of the box essentially turbos to. It's uh, AMD's version of uh, just you know, automatic overclocking. So we're opening up CPU Z. Uh, and obviously, if, if the 5.5 gigahertz overclock actually stuck, there's no way we'd boot into the operating system. There's, I have not come across any CPU that will just you know allow me to auto voltage, um, manually overclock, multiplier at 55 and let it boot stable so that's the that's the first red flag uh second is that cpu z is saying that we're running at every now and then it peaks to 3.8 uh but when we run an all core uh benchmark let's say an ida 64 which is what we did in the video then you'll see this core speed will cap out at roughly 3600 megahertz that's 3.6 gigahertz and that is essentially the cap for the cpu without any manual overclock set which tells us that anything we're doing in the bios where the bios says that we're actually overclocking is not actually sticking in the system. So I, I have a feeling that most, if not all of those people claiming their A320 chipsets allow them to overclock are actually just falling for the placebo effect. If we ran Cinebench before and after uh, a manual overclock in our uh, BIOS, then we would probably see no gain at all because we're not actually changing anything. The BIOS just says we are. And also for those wondering, there is no base clock toggle anywhere in here. It seems this was disabled by default, which would also indicate that uh, Gigabyte does not want you to do any uh, manual overclocking at all. That would be our second resort, right? Base clock overclocking was something we did heavily uh, with locked Skylake SKUs from Intel. There is no toggle for that that I can find in this BIOS here. So here's a synopsis on the deal. As bare bones as this thing is, Gigabyte's actually included a few decent features, including that M.2 port we addressed earlier, along with PWM fan support. Usually you just see voltage control, but PWM support is nice. You'll still find a USB 3 hub as well, something I forgot to mention earlier, uh, just no type C support. But all in all for 50 bucks, the A320M S2H isn't too shabby. I mean, now for the question of viability, which I wanna talk about next, that's a different story. The A320 chipset is packed full of compromises, including but not limited to, obviously, CPU overclockability. All Ryzen CPU sport unlock multipliers, so it seems kind of like a, a waste to pair them with locked chipsets, especially the higher-end SKUs. It's a bit like, on Intel's side, purchasing an i5-8600K and then pairing it with a B360 chipset. In my opinion, those two just don't add up. And to be honest, Gigabyte sells nearly identical B350 boards for something in the realm of like five to 10 bucks more. So the idea that A320 chipsets have a place in the market at these current price points seems a bit far-fetched. I, I would say this, this should be priced more in the realm of 40 bucks or less. My advice is spend a few extra bucks on the better board, maybe even a better VRM than the one Gigabyte recycled through pretty much its entire first-gen Ryzen lineup. Nothing performance-wise was really an issue here, but the lack of native overclocking support is a real kick in the teeth, in my opinion. There may be occasional BIOS updates that support overclocking in the future, or, you know, base clock overclocking, uh, but as a general rule, these chipsets are locked because their power delivery layouts aren't rated for higher wattages. I mean, 
Come on, imagine like running a 2700X overclocked on this board here. The VRM doesn't even have a heat sink. And when you're dealing with 100 amps, right, under load, things can get quite toasty and uh, that's dangerous. So if your intent going into this video was to give the A320 chipset a chance, you don't. For most, if not all gamers on a budget, the B350 or 450 chipsets will go a long way for just a few extra bucks. Again, overclocking is a huge part of that, but you may also get on board Wi-Fi, Crossfire and SLI support, additional SATA ports, RAM slots. I mean, two RAM slots, are you kidding me? The list goes on. I did have a lot of fun creating this video though, and I do appreciate you taking time out of your day to indulge in your morbid curiosity like I did here. Cheap stuff is always fun to test. Maybe next time I'll throw a 2700X into this thing and overclock it till the chokes melt away. I don't know. I might want to try that outside. We shall see. If you guys like this video, thumbs up, thumbs down. If you feel the complete opposite or if you hate everything about life, you know what to do. Red subscribe button is down below. If you want to click that, I would appreciate it. Stay tuned for the next video. This is Science Studio. Thanks for indulging in your curiosities with me.